When it comes to the missing middle, buildings up to four stories in height, it's quite a unique creature because it could fall under, under either part three or part nine of the Ontario building code. So the mid rise and the tall buildings that we see out there fall and design uh, according to part three of the building code and small residential projects uh, are designed according to part nine of the building code, which is more permissive. But what about the missing middle? It could fall either way. Um, and and we're aware that um, moving from part nine to part three has major consequences on design, construction, and cost. So to gain a better understanding, I invited our code consultant, Megan Nicoletti, a partner at Codenext, to discuss what it means for the missing middle. So Megan, thank you very much for being here today. So when moving from three to four stories, what are the main consequences uh, and requirements in code uh, that impact the complexity of design and construction and therefore cost? I understand it's a very, very broad question that we could probably run a conference uh, about. So give us your 10 top tips. Okay, yeah, this is actually um, almost a line in the sand with respect to moving from a three story to a four story. The code requirements can get quite descriptive. Um, it really defines a building, whether you're a three story or a four story. Uh, the biggest parameter that you have to consider is that the minute you become a four story building, you cross the threshold from being permitted to be classified as a part nine building. You move into a part three building. So that's one of the biggest ones. You have to design a four story as part three. The other requirements that you would have to consider would be kind of your construction requirements that go hand in hand with that. So for example, a four story building, you may have to employ a sprinkler system or non combustible construction. Whereas under the part nine, you could have been permitted to be combustible. Um, there's other things such as interior fire separations that you may have to consider, which are not ideal in anybody's kind of home. Um, you know, having your stairs enclosed and not open um, is not really desirable, as well as uh, certain life safety systems that you may now have to consider for a four story, such as like a standpipe system or exit signage or even a fire safety plan. So on that question, what are some of the differences uh, in multi-dwelling versus single dwelling uh, in, in regards to part three versus part nine? You could have three-story multi-unit and there are consequences to that too, but they're not as onerous or stringent because they're still regulated by part nine, right? So you still don't get into a lot of those heavier requirements, but a lot of them have no bearing whether it's single unit or multi-unit. So they're, they're not as um, onerous to someone who are building. It's really just the three-story or the four-story. Let's talk about converting a structure, uh, an existing structure, perhaps single family house to a multi uh, unit dwelling. Yeah, there's a lot of protective measures that have to be considered when you move from like a multi unit to a single family home or from a single family home to a multi unit. Um, certain things that you have to do is you have to protect your neighbor. So you're going to have to consider internal fire separations, fire rated separations, because you don't necessarily know what's happening beyond the wall. Um, there's other complexities with respect to egress, specifically with shared egress facilities, right? Um, so the code really outlines and gives explicit requirements for that. Uh, there's even exposure concerns, which we run into a lot. Um, so this is kind of your radiation off the front of the building, especially when you have these shared egress facilities. So you have those exposure concerns because you have numerous compartments now that could expose people evacuating a building. Um, you need to consider certain things such as provisions for a fire alarm system. So the code defines it if you have more than 10 people um, in a residential occupancy, then you need to have a fire alarm system. So multi-dwelling units will have to employ that. Uh, Barrier-free design, the exemptions for barrier-free design are limited to houses, which are defined as only two dwelling units, uh, triplexes and rooming houses having up to eight people. So anything beyond that in a multi-dwelling unit will need to employ barrier-free design fully um, per 3.8 of the building code. And you also, um, one thing people often miss is the uh, retrofit requirements under the Ontario Fire Code. Uh, these are retroactively enforced. So these are um, governed at any time, but you have to ensure that you employ those requirements as well because they are very specific to um, multi-dwelling units. What, what would you say are some of the most important aspects of converting um, a single family dwelling to a uh, multi-unit dwelling from code perspective? So all those walls, um, even if you have a multi-unit, like um, you have say a larger home and you divide it into four or five suites, right? In bedrooms, you still have to have the demising between those bedroom units or between those dwelling units. So that's one of the biggest things that people come 
um, to us asking questions on how do we do this and also being mindful that um, upgrading existing systems to have a fire protection rating or a fire resistance rating um, is not quite simple um, considering you're working with what you have, the construction requirements that you have, right? You can't just add a layer of drywall and assume you're good to go. A question I get asked a lot, elevator and accessibility uh, generally. Uh, when a full barrier-free design is required? So what the requirement is, is there is an exemption for barrier-free path of travel. So part nine just refers you back to part three. So it doesn't matter whether you're a three-story or a four-story. However, the barrier-free requirements kick in um, under the classification of the building in the sense of whether you are a house, a duplex, or a rooming house. So the only exemptions are if you're a house, which is defined as two building units, if you're a rooming house, which is up to, uh, permitted up to eight persons, or you are a triplex. So if you're into a multiple dwelling, be mindful of that because the minute you have more than kind of say three or three units, you have to employ the full barrier-free requirements of the code. And last question before we wrap up, tell us something that you find surprising or you would like our audience to be aware of. Um, the other thing I just kind of wanted to emphasize is that different jurisdictions have different interpretations as well. And we have had some complexities that have come through and these are kind of gaps in the code um, that you know I want people to be aware of because we're still kind of finding our way through these and how to address these. Um, specifically with respect to say rooftop terraces. Um, some jurisdictions have describe these as an additional story to the building. Um, how we address egress off of these rooftop terraces is another question that commonly comes up. So these are kind of gaps in the code that we don't, the code does not address well, and that we have to kind of work with our clients, work with the cities and find you know, a safe option. Um, another one is exit exposure. So this is potentially uh, occurs more in multi dwellings where you have that kind of shared egress or that kind of front porch that everybody kind of egresses onto. Um, you have a lot of exposure concerns there. And the code, the code is your baseline, but it is very conservative in this sense. And it essentially says any window within a certain proximity has to be protected. And, you know, in a, in a dwelling unit that does kind of works against what you're trying to do, as well as other avenues of the code that require operable windows for ventilation. So you have to kind of work with both of those and satisfy both of those requirements, which can be difficult. However, if you actually engineer a solution, and this is where the code allows you to do your alternative solutions, but you can engineer a solution that can maybe tone back some of those protective openings by doing kind of um, calculations on kind of thermal radiation to see the extent of exposure that would actually occur versus just kind of drawing a box on your page. Um, so that's one um, gap there that we've seen some jurisdictions are receptive to. And the other thing too, that was um, kind of surprising when I was first learning the code was part nine buildings do not require water supply for firefighting. And that to me was kind of shocking. It was kind of the whole premise of, kind of let it building burn. Um, but I guess it's the, because these buildings are small, so small that they have a reduced threat. Um, so that being said, local jurisdictions will often step in and say, hey, we need to be able to put out a fire if this building is on fire. So we do want water supply, but there's nothing in the code under part nine that says you have to have a, a hydrant on your property or nearby, thereby to protect the building. So those are just some of the gaps in the code that I want people to be aware of that we've come across and you know, we're still kind of finding our way through. Thank you very much, Megan, for being here today. And for you guys, I hope you learned something new. This is a very interesting topic. Uh, see you next time.